In this inspired insider.com interview, we talked to Stu McLaren. Listen in this interview, he talks about this is a truly powerful story that basically set the stage for him in the belief that he could do anything online and then the impact it had on his life. Also, Stu gives his biggest piece of advice for people to get more sales. And towards the end, Stu talks about what keeps him sharp and allows him to keep his edge in life and business. That and much more coming up right now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Stu McLaren, co-founder of Wishlist and Rhino Support. Wishlist powers nearly 44,000 membership sites. He also co-founded Rhino Support, which came out of the pain Wishlist was having. And it's a help desk that gives you unlimited agents for one low price. Stu, thanks for being here. Ah, thanks, Jeremy. It's good to be with you. So, so we get a lot of comments about people who have tons of ideas. They don't know where to start. They have a, maybe have a side business with a full-time job. And you're just a great person to talk about going from that idea to making that first sale. And I know you have a great story for your first sale. So would you tell us that? Yeah. So my first sale is pretty interesting because, you know, when I, first got started even wanting to sell any products or you know going down the entrepreneurial path one of the things that I knew I wanted to do was leverage the internet so I began researching and trying to learn as much as I could about selling on the internet and a lot of the, at the time a lot of people were selling ebooks and this was you know just a fast way to kind of test the concept and so I thought okay well I'm going to uh, dip my toe into this and I'm going to you know see what I can do so I came up with this idea. I love coming up with uh, lots of different ideas. And so I loved uh, Halloween because Halloween is just a very creative time of year. And so I co-wrote this book called Ideas for Halloween. And I say I co-wrote it because I hired a ghostwriter to help me flush out a lot of the ideas. So I came up with like the table of contents. I had a whole bunch of ideas that I you know, gave. And the, uh, the ghostwriter basically helped put that all together. Now, it was fairly expensive. It cost me about $600 to hire the ghost writer to you know, flush it all out. Then I hired a designer to design a nice cover and all that kind of stuff. And then you know, I was in there like putting up the website and hooking everything up and just really learning as I went. This was like my first experience. And so the problem, though, Jeremy, was that I had a bit of a, a time crunch because this was in you know, September. And well, Halloween was right around the corner, and you know my selling season, if you will, was you know kind of cutting short. So I finally got it online, and my brother-in-law, my now brother-in-law, was working with me at the time, and he was kind of like living the experience through me because he had always you know heard about selling stuff online, and he was skeptical, wasn't sure if it was you know could be done. So every day he'd come in and he'd be like, "Hey, Stu, you know, did you make a sale?" And I'd be like, no, I haven't made a sale yet, but you know, I just need to buy some more ads. So I'd go and I'd spend more money on Google AdWords. And you know, the next day he'd come in and he'd be like, have you made a sale? And, well, no, I haven't made a sale yet, but it, it's a numbers game, you know. And so I just gotta buy some more ads. So I kept spending on AdWords. You know, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just, you know, heard that this was what you needed to do in order to drive traffic. And um, he kept coming in. Have you made a sale? No. Have you made a sale? No. Have you made a sale? No. And then um, my wife and I left to go to a seminar. And so when we left, we're in the plane, we land in LA, and uh, we go get to the hotel, and what's the first thing that we do? Well, we go up to the hotel room, and I'm like online checking my stats as if like I'm going to have this huge flood of sales while I was on the plane. And um, lo and behold, I checked the stats, and Jeremy, there it was, the first sale. Seven dollars and ninety-five cents, baby. Woo! I mean, I was like on top of the world. In fact, my wife and I, I we were like high-fiving each other. I'm like, babies, you gotta capture this moment. Like, this is history right here. You know, and so she she took a picture of me, and, and in fact, later on she plaqued it for me. There I am in the hotel, you know, and um I it was just like I was on top of the world. Seven dollars and ninety-five cents. Because for me, at that time, 
making that sale, I realized, you know, this could happen. This was, I made a sale from somebody I didn't know. This could happen. It was reality. In my case, it needed a lot of tweaking, you know, because I made $7.95. At that point, I spent over $900 on Google AdWords. But it just needed a tweaking. It just needed it was a tweaking process, you know, from that point forward. So anyway, it was a huge moment for me, and you know, it really set the stage for me to be able to go on um, because I had the belief. I had the belief that this could happen. Well, fast forward a few years, and we're at my wedding, and my brother-in-law is one of our MCs, and he's retelling this story to the audience. And he's telling everybody how every day he'd come in and he'd ask if I'd made a sale, and I'd say no, but I was always optimistic that it was going to work. And he'd come in and say, did you make a sale? No. Did you make a sale? No. Did you make a sale? No. And he said, finally, when we left to go on that trip to LA, he was just so tired of you know, me saying no, I hadn't made any sale. He was kind of getting depressed. So he asked his girlfriend, who I had no idea who she was, he asked his girlfriend if she could just buy the darn product. And <laughs> when he said that, my jaw just dropped. I, I couldn't believe the words coming out of his mouth. But then, as I'm looking at him, and I kind of get like, I, I get goosebumps in, um, when I think about this, Jeremy, because, you know, I look at him, and, uh, and tears started rolling down my face. Because he had no idea the impact that he had on my life. Because that first sale, it instilled so much belief in me that things that this could work and I've since gone on to make millions and millions of dollars by selling products on on the web and as a result of that it's enabled my wife and I to be able to start our own charity and to impact you know thousands of kids lives over in Kenya none of that would have been possible had it not been for that first sale so you know it it's an amazing story because it's really a first sale that was fabricated it didn't really happen but what it did do was it instilled the belief in me that it could happen. And based on that, you know, like I said, you know, we've gone on to sell millions of dollars of our products and services on the web, and none of it would have happened had it not been for that first sale. So, you know, people always try to focus on making ten thousand dollars a month or a hundred thousand dollars a month or making millions and millions of dollars, but the reality of it is none of it happens until you make that first sale. And so focus on making that first sale. It's one of my favorite stories. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, we'll have to thank your brother-in-law. Um, so tell us about, now we go from that first sale to that, that pivotal moment or that, that milestone in your business. Can you tell us about what you were hitting and what you had to do at that point with your business? Yeah, so for me, there was still a lot of uh, exploration at that point. Even though I made that first sale, um, and, and it instilled the belief, I knew that I had to fix a lot of things. Like, I had spent a lot of money on advertising, uh, or, you know, like I said, over $900 in advertising, and then there's the cost of producing the product. And, you know, really, I, at that point, I only made $8 or $7.95. So, um, there was a lot of learning that still needed to be done. And, you know, over time, I've learned as far as how to properly position products and services, how to really meet customer needs and create a product that people want. And from my experience, it has just really come from creating products that I myself would want. You know, so in the case of Wishlist Member, uh, that came out of my frustration with membership software that was available at the time. I'm fairly technical. I work on a computer every single day. So, you know, for me, it's I can figure stuff out. But that, back then, it was ridiculously difficult to be able to design and develop a membership site using WordPress. And so that idea came out of that frustration. And then again, now with Rhino support, same thing is happening. We had a real frustration with our uh, help desk because our company was growing. At the time, we had 16 full-time people. We're now up to 17 full-time people. And the way that most of these help desks um, make their money is they charge on a per-agent basis. So our company was paying $50 per month per agent. So you know our costs are over 800 bucks a month. So it gets very, very expensive. And I was very conflicted um, with the fact that I wanted to provide more support, but I couldn't be, or I could, but it was just, it was that whole, you know, business owner taking over saying, no, Stu, that's more money, you should, you know, you shouldn't have to do that. So 
we went to the drawing board and that's where we came up with the idea for Rhino Support. And both products have been uh, well received in the marketplace and I think a large part of it comes from the fact that I myself am you know, my own customer. And so when you do that, you really get a chance to um, you know, catch the pulse of your customer base and you can really speak to them as, in terms of what's important to them. Yeah, so we have to tap in our own pain and see, you know, definitely kind of fill our own need with it. Will you tell us about a milestone? You hit a business milestone after six months um, and what you had to do to transition your consulting clients. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so with our wish list uh, business, you know, prior to that, I had a consulting business where, you know, I had, uh, it was a very successful business. It was a five figure a month. Uh, consulting business where I was helping uh, specifically with affiliate management and the challenge with that though was it was all based on my time so you know it, it required me to show up every day and um, there's you know some good in that but at the same time there's no leverage in that because I can only grow it so much until I you know have to start adding more people but again it's all dependent on people's time and so when Wishlist came along and we kind of started to see that, hey, this thing has some legs, um, I made a decision very early on that I wanted to transition from the consulting business to the software business. And it was a really tough call because, like I said, we were making great money in the consulting business. And my wife and I had the conversation, and you know, she's a full-time teacher. And so we basically said, uh, you know, she said, listen, you know, we can, we can go for this. We can live off of my salary. And, you know, if this works, great. If it doesn't, then, you know, uh, we'll just have to, you know, make do as we go by. And so, you know, I remember we made that decision when the business wish list was doing consistently around $5,000 a month, which wasn't a lot because, of course, I got a business partner and now I've got uh, two business partners. So, you know, that gets split. And then we had the cost of you know staff and stuff like that, so it wasn't a lot of money at all. But um, it then it allowed me to grow into it. So I transitioned slowly, and then um, the big turning point for me was when uh, our business started to consistently hit twenty thousand dollars a month. And at that point, we we really knew this was a you know um, a business that you know could sustain itself. And at that point, um, I had gone full time. And then my uh, business partner, Tracy, he decided to go full-time on Wishlist. And that really was the turning point. We hired a, bu uh, a number of other people to come help us, and we've really significantly grown the business uh, from that day forward. And then could you talk about, um, there was one client that you held on to. Mm. Yeah, so when I was transitioning out of that consulting business, um, you know, I had to have some tough conversations with clients who I had been helping for years. And one of them in particular, I just, I really struggled um, to gain the courage to have that conversation with him because he had really served as a mentor to me. Um, I looked to him almost like an older brother, and um, I just didn't want to disappoint him um, in the sense that I wouldn't be able to continue to help him. But at, at the same time, I was really conflicted because I knew that I couldn't give him the time that he deserved because of the needs that uh, our wishlist business was, you know, starting to have. So, um, I it, it took me a while, you know, to have the courage. I finally called him, and uh, I got pretty emotional when I was uh, sharing it with him. And I'll never forget, uh, you know, after I finished uh, talking, there was like this awkward pause, and and then I kind of hear him chuckle, and I'm like, dude, I just spilled my heart out. Like, what the heck? And he kind of chuckles, and he said, listen, Stu, he's like. Like, we've known that this was coming for quite some time. He's like, everything's going to be fine. He's like, uh, we've actually been preparing behind the scenes for when you would have this conversation with us. So it was kind of like a bittersweet moment because, you know, I, I was um, very scared about having that conversation because he meant so much to me. But at the same time, that's probably why he meant so much to me is because he knew that this was going to come and uh, he had already um, accounted for that. And, you know, we're still good friends today. Um, we still get together, you know, multiple times a year, and, and still connect. And he's actually one of our biggest donors for uh, the charity that my wife and I run. And so there's still a, a great bond there. But it, it, it really was tough. But at the same time, once I had um, transitioned away from that consulting business entirely, it was like a huge weight lifted off my shoulders because now I knew I was in a leveraged business where if I could just focus my efforts 
every effort would be magnified or leveraged there, uh, thereafter because of the nature of what we were selling. So it really was a great moment for us. Yeah, I mean, it's a great story. And, you know, going from that idea, that first sale, to hitting those big milestones, that's great. And the audience wants to know, how do I get from that point to hitting those big milestones, especially if they don't have your, your brother-in-law to, to get them their first sale? What's, one, what's a piece of advice you give the audience right now to, to get their first sale, to transition that? You know, um, my, my piece of advice for people is that it is very, very easy to get caught up in the excitement of your idea. And, you know, you can, you'll start envisioning, like, what could be and serving, you know, millions of people and, you know, all this revenue coming in and what that would mean for you and your family and all that stuff. But the reality of it is, just like my first $7.95, none of all the rest can happen until you make that first sale. So you really have to be able to put yourself in a position where you can test your idea in a, in a place where people are actually going to give you money. You know, a lot of times people give their products away for free and they assume that because they're giving it away for free and they're getting a great response, that it's therefore going to be a great product in the marketplace. Well, I would challenge that a little bit. You know, people may be excited because it's free. They're not necessarily um, ponying up any money for it at that point. And so you really want to test your ideas in a marketplace where people are going to put money up front. You know, and start the price lower, and then you can, you know, raise the price thereafter. Um, you know, and you'll kind of, you'll get a sense of it almost right away. Like, oh, this is too high because, you know, less pe the conversions are lower um, at this price point than they were at this price point. And so you kind of have to gauge that. But my advice is focus on that first sale. Get your first customer. Learn as much about them and why they bought the product. You know, what were they looking for the product to serve in terms of their needs? And, you know, um, just gather as much feedback and, and, and intel as you can from that first customer and then use that as a, as a starting point moving forward. Yeah. And there's something, Stu, you do in particular to keep your edge and to stay sharp and in life and in business uh, with one of your adventures. Yeah, Tell us one I, of those. I, I love, um, I don't know what it is, but I, I kind of love feeling uh, fear and then moving forward in, in despite that fear. And so I, every time, every year, um, I seek out multiple, um, you know, thrill-seeking adventures, you know. In fact, uh, just last weekend, uh, my wife and I and my sister and her boyfriend, um, we went dog sledding. So, you know, we were up, up north and, uh, you know, we've got these dogs and we're tied, you know, that are all hooked up to this little sled. And it is crazy, Jeremy. You're moving, like, ridiculously fast. And in the beginning, the dogs are all jacked up. They're, like, pumped and ready to go. And we're on this tiny trail, and we're zip, zip through, and the trees are right there. And, you know, your blood is just pumping. Well, I love those experiences, you know, and I do those every year. Like, last year, I went skydiving. I jumped off the stratosphere in Las Vegas. I went, uh, um, drove dune buggies in the desert. I went swimming with the sharks. Like, I, I love doing all these types of things. Because it gets your adrenaline going, but not only that, like there are moments when you're about to jump in with the sharks or you're about to jump off that building or jump out of that plane where you second guess yourself. You're like, do I really want to do this? And I love being in that moment where you're second guessing and pushing forward anyway. Because when you learn to train yourself to push forward, even despite feeling that fear, nothing can stop you. And to me, that is very, very applicable to business because there are times, my friend, when you know we as entrepreneurs are absolutely going to feel fear. Like you know, we are you know scared to get our product out there. Like I still experience it now, even when we were launching Rhino Support, we had a long beta, like six month beta with that product. And when I look back, I think part of it was I I just love that product so much, and and I was like. It's like a, it's like a, my baby, and I, I was scared that if I release it to the world, what if it's not accepted? You, you want know? to be perfect, yeah. And yeah, and and that is a common thing for people, uh, especially entrepreneurs. And so you got to learn to feel that fear and move forward anyway. And that's partly why I definitely seek out those uh, adventures because it puts me in that mindset and trains me to move forward regardless of how I'm feeling. For sure. What are some tools and software you use in your business? 
Well, I use the two that we created. I use them every day. You know, I, I joke around we're like the hair club for men because not only did we create the product, but we use it too. So I use a wishlist member. I use Rhino support. I use another tool for email um, called followup.cc. It is probably one of the, my favorite little tools. I think it's $10 a month. Saves me a ton of time. Allows me to um, get back or um, basically allows me to clean my inbox. So and then if there's messages that I need to get back to, it'll resend them to me at a specified period of time. So it's a great tool. I use um, BufferApp.com um, to schedule my social media messages. I use Evernote like Evernote is my lifeline. I use that uh, every single day. Um, and then I use like a little, a, a few little tools, um, especially when you're working virtually with um, our team. Like our, all of our team, all 17 people that work for us are all virtual. So we use tools like Dropbox, uh, we use Basecamp, we use, um, uh, I use a little tool called Push, P-U-U-S-H uh, dot com. Um, it just basically allows me to easily share links and stuff like that. So those are a few tools that I use every day. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. Now, Sue, so really appreciate your time. Where can people reach out and thank you? Um, yeah, my personal blog is stu, S-T-U dot me. Um, our uh, wishlist member is at wishlistmember.com. And then our newest baby is uh, Rhino Support, and that is at rhinosupport.com. Thanks, Stu. I appreciate it. And I wanted you to, to tell us one last story about um, that person who came up to you, because this is part of the rewarding parts of business uh, with Wishlist. Do you remember that one? Yeah. You know, um, for about a year and a half, I... Uh, was basically bunkered down at home because my wife and I had our first child, uh, little Marla, and so you know I wanted to be home and I wanted to make sure that uh, you know everything was stable because I'm first time dad, so I didn't I didn't know what it was like to be a dad. So I did very little traveling. I wasn't going to many conferences or workshops and stuff like that. And then this last year, I started slowly uh, to go to a, a few different uh, workshops and seminars and stuff. And at one of them in particular. Um, there were a lot of our customers there, and I was kind of, you know, taken back a little bit because, you know, many times we forget the impact that our products and services can have on our customers and what it means to them. And different people were coming up and sharing like the fact that they had got their site up and that it was power, you know, their their, their site was powered by Wishlist Member and what that meant to them and how successful their business was doing, and it was awesome. But one story in particular really kind of tugged at the heartstrings because. Um, this gentleman, his name was Noel Meter, and he runs an organization called StrongerFamilies.org. And basically what they do is they help bring families closer together because their research has shown that families where one of the spouses are in a high-risk uh, occupation, like in the Army or uh, they're a police officer or what have you, when one of the spouses is in one of those high-risk occupations, there is between a 70 to 80 percent divorce rate, wow. and so their goal is to reduce that divorce rate by, you know, training these families on how to get together through those hard times. And their old model of serving all these people were to do hundreds and hundreds of workshops all across uh, North America. And that was very costly. It was very time-consuming, but at the same time, it was very rewarding because they were able to reach, uh, you know, quite a number of people. But it, the main thing for them was they were limited as far as the number of people they could reach based on the number of events that they could do each year. So then he goes on to tell me that they completely transformed that entire business using Wishlist Member, and he said they took the same training that they were teaching in those workshops and they put it into a membership site and now they're able to reach thousands and thousands of more families in locations that they never have visited before and as a result their costs are way lower and they still do four workshops a year so they've gone from hundreds of workshops to four workshops and so you know the way he basically put it was your software has enabled us to reach far more people at a fraction of the cost that it used to, allowing us to have way more impact. He's like, your software is helping keep families together. And I was just like, wow. You know, sometimes when we create products and services, we don't realize the ripple effect that it has on the world. 
And in our case, you know, we've got tens of thousands of people who have developed membership sites who are all providing you know, information to some audience or some group. And so you, when you begin to think about the ripple effect of what you know, this one idea which this member has had on all these people, it really begins to put things in perspective. And for me, it just renewed my um, excitement for what it is that we have done and the impact that we're having through creating software. Stu, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> Cheers.